is more engaging, but because there's two of us and there's a time limit, uh, we are just going to be reading from our script. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm Eve Weston, and uh, I've been working with Julie on this project. Well, thank you for having us. Really excited to share it with you all. Um, you may not recognize me from previous Egyptology conferences because I have not been at previous Egyptology conferences. This is my first. Mm -hmm. um, so just a little bit on my background. Um, while not being an Egyptologist, I like to think I'm Egyptology adjacent. I studied classics at Princeton as an undergrad, and I have a fondness for ancient history and culture. Um, my background professionally is as a television comedy writer, uh, writing for sitcoms in Los Angeles. Um, and then I, after that, I took my knowledge from working on sitcoms and brought that over into the world of virtual reality. Uh, I've recently created the first 360 VR sitcom and teach um, 360 VR filmmaking at Emerson College Los Angeles. So um, it's really exciting to combine our skill sets. I think we both have different expertise and together <coughs> we to explore what we might be able to do. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about, about that. Um, and so yes, yeah, so that's Eve, so I'm Julia. <laughs> that wasn't clear before. Julia Crochet at Missouri State University. Um, and I'm the Egyptology side of this project and a bit of the pedagogy side as well. Um, okay, so research has shown that virtual and augmented reality simulators, immersive and digital learning environments, and technological applications in the classroom broadly defined can greatly benefit student learning and retention. Just as all resources we bring into our classes need to be thoughtfully considered, new technologies similarly need to be assessed. Too often we find ourselves like flies to a bright light running to the new shiny tech thing. Indeed, technology, if not deployed intentionally and with pedagogy in mind, can easily become a barrier to learning rather than an aid. Technology is most often found in the modern classroom in three areas, and I say classroom here because I teach in a teaching intensive university, but this could apply to museum settings and other settings as well. So technology is most often found um, as teaching tools like PowerPoint, as student learning tools, digital flashcards and the like, information and communication technologies, email, banner, a blackboard, etc. Students are increasingly experiencing their world through technology and screens, accessing readings, taking notes, and submitting work on their computers, phones, and tablets. Technology has infected our classrooms, and it's not going away, nor should it. Technology has proven itself to be an incredibly useful educational ally. It enables clear communication. I can't imagine doing this presentation without PowerPoint. Um, it provides greater accessibility for more students with different learning styles backgrounds and abilities. It can be employed to encourage active learning and student participation in large classrooms where it would otherwise be difficult. Despite these identifiable benefits, technology can also present real challenges in the classroom, especially for digital immigrants. Mark Prinsky coined the term digital native and digital immigrant in a 2001 article for the education journal On the Horizon. And I have, I'm going to be giving you guys a lot of statistics um, that are going to be drawn from different studies and I have bibliography for those if anybody's interested in those locations. So digital immigrants are in essence learning a new language, or so Prinsky asserts. A language learned as an adult, he says, is stored differently in our brains than language learned as a child. Digital natives, on the other hand, are students who have been raised around technology and for whom using technology is innate. We may assume most, if not all, of our students, being mostly millennials or younger, born after 1977, are digital natives. Our educational system, however, is built by digital immigrants and is not entirely caught up to our students. So Prinsky begins his article with a bold statement. Uh, literally, in the version published on his personal website, he bolds and italicizes the statement. Our students have changed radically. Today's students are no longer the people our education system was designed to teach. However, assuming our students are digital natives, because of their age, may be short-sighted. Problematically, nowhere in Prinsky's very highly cited article does he address privilege, ability, wealth, or any number of a myriad of variables that can affect one's ability to interact with, access, uh, and access technologies. Especially in underprivileged communities and in more rural academic settings, we cannot assume our students, no matter their age, have access to and experience with technology to the point that they are natives. So for those who are digital immigrants, for whatever the reason, when they grew up, their ability, whatever, new technologies can become a hindrance to teaching and learning and can even be insurmountable. Technology employed for technology's sake should never be a guiding justification. As easy as technology can make materials more accessible, the vast majority of us are not software engineers, although I know there are some in the room perhaps, 
and it's easy for online materials to veer away from universal design principles in ways that the end user cannot predict or fix. The internet provides students across the world with incredible access to knowledge, both popular and academic. However, this deductive ease of command, copy, paste also makes cheating and plagiarism incredibly easy, especially when our university students are rarely receiving academic digital ethics training in their secondary education. There are also pedagogical concerns to be considered when implementing technology in the classroom. People tend to read less actively when they read from a screen as compared to physical print, uh, leading to worse information re uh, retention. Specifically, Muller and Oppenheimer have shown that writing notes out longhand may help students retain knowledge better due to typing's, quote, shallower processing. But despite all these potential challenges, we're still advocating for the robust use of technology in the classroom because there are indeed real benefits as well. We simply urge caution and encourage critical examination of new technologies before they are incorporated into the classroom education. We should always ask what our students' learning objectives are and ask if or how tech will help students achieve these goals. We should consider if the new technology enables us to communicate ideas clearer to a wider audience, or even if it simply makes our lives of instructors easy or easier. As somebody who has at least 200 students usually, that's a valid concern. We need to consider the pedagogical purpose of every technology we bring into our classrooms and weigh this against the potential hurdles that it may create for our students especially for our most vulnerable students. Notably, not all technology is created equal. There are certain technologies with proven pedagogical benefits. So Meyer et al. has argued that visual images in concert with speech is better for student learning than images and text alone that can compete when a student's looking at them. Immersive environments, either real or digital, have been found to greatly benefit student learning and retention. Further, Jacobson has shown that within virtual worlds, immersive environments, so those that you can physically move around in, such as projected VR or AR, aid in student retention over 2D flat environments, be they virtual or not, including those that are digital. So the idea is walking in a yurt is better for student retention than walk, walking through a 3D model on a 2D screen. An immersive virtual and augmented reality, the screen, which in other media can act as a barrier, actually becomes a door. Students can get closer to the objects of study than physically possible. A student can manipulate a digitally projected molecule, watch a projection of a supernova explosion, or walk along an ancient Egyptian funeral procession. So we've developed a virtual reality experience that uses XR to provide a unique first-person experience that ancient Egyptians would have died for, literally. <laughs> As a participant in the spirit of Egypt, you'll get to experience the funerary rites and perceived afterlife experience of ancient Egypt as the spirit of a dead pharaoh, specifically Hatshepsut, the first female pharaoh of Egypt. Neither archaeology nor time travel could provide this type of experience. Only XR. You, and I use you consciously, to evoke this effective presence that VR is known for, you as a participant will inhabit bodies, objects, and realms not available to living humans at any time and only available to the most elite of the dead. This experience takes place in four main locations. The Theban funeral procession, the Pharaoh's tomb, the mortuary temple, and the hereafter. Hovering over your own funeral procession, you can move around and eavesdrop on conversations <coughs> among priests family, musicians, whalers, bodyguards, or even the hoi polloi. These conversations will provide information about you, the deceased Hatshepsut, about everyday ancient Egyptian life, and about how you, the spirit, might best prepare for what's to come in the hereafter. Most importantly, these conversations convey that ancient Egyptians weren't just mummies and wall paintings. They were human. At your tomb, you'll participate in your opening of the mouth ritual. <coughs> then you can engage in the rest of the game world and fill your power tanks, strength, equipment, and knowledge, which allow you to persist and succeed in the game. These power tanks are based on emic Egyptian ideas of the effects of death. The Egyptian dead were often described as eker, or able, that's the strength, and being equipped, aper, with both knowledge and all the trappings of a proper burial, the equipment. Practically, in the spirit of Egypt experience, strength gives you the energy needed to travel between locations. It is derived from food and clothing and from resting. Equipment is refilled by jewels, spears, and amulets. 
Knowledge is obtained by reading scrolls, deciphering what's depicted on the tomb walls, and listening to the living. And while certain knowledge fills your power tank, other knowledge must be remembered and used practically to succeed in the experience. Sources of all three types of power can be found in both the tomb and the mortuary temple. In the tomb, you can collect food, clothing, jewels, and amulets, and glean knowledge from the books of the netherworld. You may also inhabit your mummy, which transports you into an otherworld meditation, after which you depart with increased strength. In the mortuary temple, you may interact with the living. It's the only place you can do so now that your funeral procession is over. You'll hear mourners in supplication offering gifts and asking for favors or blessings in return. And you can gain knowledge by entering their dreams or from listening to them recount their adventures, perhaps of accompanying you, the great Hashemtseth, to punt, as depicted on the temple wall. In the hereafter, you'll encounter three <coughs> chronological sections comprised of the 12 symbolic hours of the Egyptian afterlife. In each, early, deep, and ascending, you'll need to accomplish a task or tasks in order to pass through and continue on your journey to defeat Apophis and save his son. These tasks may require strength, equipment, and or stored or practical knowledge. Once the sun is in the sky, you've succeeded in completing your task and have effectively won the game. While there are other rules, details, and specifics, this is the basic outline of the spirit of Egypt and enough context for us to use this experience as a case study for effective immersive pedagogical techniques. So we've identified three teaching strategies that have proven effectiveness in traditional seated classrooms, and it stands to reason would be similarly effective in XR. So that is storytelling as pedagogy, humor, and interactivity or experiential learning. So storytelling as pedagogical, as pedagogical tool is not novel or new. Uh, despite it being one of the oldest forms of teaching, it remains pedagogically effective today, especially when combined with narrative inquiry models. Learning which stems from a developed and well-performed story is remembered more accurately and notably longer than learning facts and figures alone. Indeed, Egan has argued that storytelling is, quote, not just some casual entertainment, it reflects a basic and powerful form in which we make sense of the world and experience. Denise Trocha has spoken in favor of storytelling as pedagogy, in part because, and here we quote again, our students' lived experience is the foundation for their learning. In the spirit of Egypt, the student's lived experience is the afterlife experience of Hatshepsut's Ba spirit, tasked nightly with defeating Apophis. That is a story. Still, within it, there are other opportunities to employ story and enjoy its pedagogical benefits. For example, at the funeral procession, you'll overhear conversations between various types of people in the ancient world. You may hear the bodyguards discussing their career anxieties. <laughs> now that the chefs have gone, will the next pharaoh keep them at the palace? May they, like Sinue, fear retribution or responsibility for her death? You can even eavesdrop on Hatshepsut's daughter, Nefere, who has a completely different reaction. Hatshepsut's passing has inspired in her a deep determination. As the only living relation of the Amasite family line, she's perhaps <coughs> preparing herself to fight to be the pharaoh that will follow Hatshepsut's co-regent, Thutmose III. In a VR experience like the spirit of Egypt, history ceases to be far removed. It is happening right in front of you. Hearing firsthand how Hatshepsut's contemporaries speak about her passing lets you understand what these historical events really meant to people at the time. Humor as a pedagogical tool is a bit more controversial, especially in elite academic circles. Humor can be construed as not serious and therefore inappropriate in certain academic environments. However, we all know that the best conference papers are the ones that make us laugh a bit. And this is backed up by science. Bull and Dolan's neuroscience research reveals that humor systematically activates the brain dopamine reward system. And cognitive studies show that dopamine is important for both goal-oriented motivation and long-term memory. Furthermore, Danis et al. has in 2012 indicated that correctly used humor can improve student retention um, from students in kindergarten through college. There are unlimited opportunities for humor in the spirit of Egypt. One simple example comes in hour one of the hereafter. You must know the name of the divine gatekeeper in order to pass through the gate. Back in the tomb, you will have had the opportunity to read the gatekeeper's name in hieroglyphs in an Amduat scene. 
Now you have to remember it. In a sort of matching game, you'll have to associate the correct name with the gatekeeper, choosing from several names on Hello My Name Is sticker. <laughs> the unexpected use of this contemporary convention in an ancient spiritual place produces an incongruity that's humorous without undermining the information being conveyed. It will make this moment and its lessons that, that much more memorable. So spiritual learning as good pedagogy is also not new. Um, Paulo Freire's uh, Friars, 1970 seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, was, among other things, an early proponent of experiential learning. Other scholars of education and pedagogy have had similarly long called for more active student engagements in the classroom. This goes back to Dewey and even earlier. More recently, research on embodied approaches to cognition have shown a positive correlation between kinesthetic movements, which is moving around, um, something as simple as walking on a treadmill while studying, so a positive correlation between kinesthetic movements and studying and retention of that information. And why is experiential active learning so important? It helps us learn deeper and remember what we've learned longer. According to a 1969 study by Dale, after two weeks we tend to remember 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, and about 90% of what we do. As Balanson writes in his seminal work on VR, quote, a VR experience is often better understood not as a media experience, but as an actual experience, with the attendant results for our behavior. There can be no doubt then that immersive ritual and augmented reality is the next stage of experiential learning. Previously, experiential learning was limited by the physical limitations of our world, including those of time and space. Not so anymore with the rise of XR. We can now recreate scenarios that would previously have been impossible. Students will not just witness them, but participate in them. For example, the ancient Egyptians believed that the deceased had to do the same work in the hereafter as on Earth. So in hour four of the spirit of Egypt, you're given the option to do your work yourself or send your Shakti. If you opt to send your Shakti, you have to go find it in your tomb. And to travel to your tomb or mortuary temple, you can't just push a button. You'll need to flap your arms like a ba bird. Since one learns more when engaging kinesthetics, VR's ability to add interaction that is physically engaging presents a pedagogical advantage. <laughs> Example. <laughs> Once you're in your tomb, if you're not familiar with what a shabti looks like or what the objects present are, you can point to them and the Ba spirit of the object will explain itself to you. And if you're not familiar with an object in your mortuary temple, you can anoint the person offering it and they will explain what it is and why they've brought it for you. <coughs> Thus, in your search for one simple play object, you're not just learning what a shakti is, you're interactively learning about many other ancient Egyptian objects, traditions, and beliefs. We suggest that a real benefit to instruction and student learning can be found at the intersection of traditional classroom pedagogy and immersive virtual reality. The spirit of Egypt consciously employs storytelling, humor, and interactivity, showing how they might now be effectively employed in an immersive historical VR experience. We are continuing to develop this game and hope to incorporate more 3D objects and more spaces that are historically modeled, such as Hatshepsut's mortuary temple at Deir El Bari and her valley tomb. We very much appreciate your thoughts, and we also have a very small demo of the game with us so if you'd like to see it at some point after the discussion of this section, please come up to us. We'd be very happy to show it to you and get your thoughts. Thank you very much, and thanks to everybody who helped us. So thanks very much to Julia and uh, Eve for uh, for a nice talk on something that I think.